Yeah, yeah, we call him Lucy. 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 Uh, Lucy. <laughs> Afro lawyer. <laughs> Afro lawyer. 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 Afro Honorable Justice Dahiru Mustafa, GCON, the immediate past Chief Justice of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, has had a rewarding career in the judiciary. He was born in this family house in Babura, in Babura local government area of Jigawa State on the 14th of July, 1942. My parents were late Alhaji Mustafa Babura, and Hajia Hadiza Mustafa Barbara. I'm lucky that my mother is alive and she's with me in this house. But my father died about uh, 22 years ago. He died at the district head of Barbara. His mother, Hajia Hadiza Mustafa, tells us about his early days. She Baba Nauku Tumbe Ia Rada Fever Nabar Gidonsu Bama Taradishi Young Wong wants a cut of cheese. Kari Baba de Hagia Lunakana de la Baran Toko Kakarmania to your host of an inch. It at a cut of cheese. To charge the daddy, the she hay you. Why you said Akasashi a macaran tama by a bana didn't so. Now you want our neto of Mijin now the carry of a new in the Ugan sheep. Tina Sam Auntie and Sasha a macaranta and Sasha Bako and Sasha a macaranta, Yenaraka Subasher macaranta. She was a shiba. Raka seek ye answer. It don't unpata abu a macaranter. This chess a cast about the amusa. She say about the amusa. To under the equal sashimi macaranter. I don't want an dungeon sit there. Chee take me magana no shugo. Kaji the little sugar some macaranter. Her own duty and liasa. A cacashi and liasa at a few ingila. The Mustafa family of Barbara is a large one, and each person is his brother's keeper. Yes, uh, both my father and his senior brother uh, had, amongst, had between themselves over 30 children. And we were very, very close. In fact, you know, it is uh, in Hausa culture and understanding. In fact, the word cousin does not even exist. We were all brothers and sisters and looking after ourselves. We were all very, very close, just as one family. There was no difference whatsoever. As it were, my father looked after all the children of his senior brother. In fact, all of them lived at one time or the other with him. The young Dahiru enrolled into primary school by Providence. From uh, our house at Barbara, I was following my seniors to the school and I would be standing by the window listening to what was going on in the classroom. And um, a senior people in the school at one time or the other put me in the school. And coming to school, he had nothing to do. He would go and stand by the window, 
listening quietly to what is happening in the class. Now, at that time, the admission into Barbara Primary School was every other year. We went in January 58. The next class came in January uh, 1950. S and still, Mr. Fa was too small to be admitted into primary school. Because the rules were that you must be of seven years age. Oh, uh, yes, your age must be seven years. He wasn't seven years. I think maybe about four, five, at most five years. So I noticed that a question would be asked in the class, having spent about two years or so, they find it difficult to answer. Mustafa standing by the window would raise his hands and give the answer correctly. So I told the headmaster, look, this little kid is much, much more intelligent than most of the pupils in this class. I think it would be better if a way is found to admit him into this class. He said, but he will pose a problem. A problem in the sense that he is not up to the age. Two, they have already gone far beyond, uh, uh, far, far ahead of him in the studies, despite the fact that he could do it. But I know what to do. So one afternoon, I think it was around 52, in the middle of 1952, he came to the class, went in the class, listened to the teacher, came out, Mustafa was still standing patiently in the sun. So he went quietly behind him and grabbed his hands. He became frightened. He said, no, 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 no. I was not going to do anything to you. Just, I want you to come to my class, I mean to my office. Let us talk over, ask you a few questions. So he went. He was asking the head this question he would answer, that question he would answer in arithmetic, in Arabic, in whatever was being taught in the class. The head would virtually answer correctly. I said, good. Do you want to be admitted? He said, yes, because I had no playmates in the house. Everybody is attending school. I'm the only one who is left behind. So the head was all right. So the following day, he called me. He said, I think you are right. This guy is intelligent. But he will pose a problem still. They are already writing, using the pencil to write. They are exercising and this and that. His problem is, how does he catch up? He said, give him time. So it was a cement flow. So sand was brought from outside, spread, so that you could start using his finger to learn how to write some of these, uh, A, B, C, D, and others. And some construct them into the house. Up. In no time, he caught up. They took the common entrance examination to Bowdoin Primary School, I think in Bunnukudu. Dahir Mustafa passed. Most of them failed. And I went to Burnukudu Senior Primary School, or Middle School, as it was called in those days, from January 1954 to December 1956. We met in Abudum Primary School. Um, actually, he was my senior by about a year or so. But he, even as, I mean, as, as my senior, we were very close to each other. He was one of those persons that I had met. Uh, very intelligent and very cheerful and uh, he was very much in love with the English language and we even teased him by saying that he memorized a um, chameleon dictionary in his head well of course it was a joke but that's what that's how uh, we, how, how we how, how, how we saw him at that time even though we are doing everything in Hausa, nothing in English, I try to better myself in the English language. As a matter of fact, I started memorizing the dictionary, Oxford Learner's Dictionary. And um, from there, I was uh, really um, interested almost in every other subject. What was it like at the boarding school? Well, in the boarding school, we were getting things just like we were getting at home. It was no different from the situation at home. Okay. They are feeding us properly, looking after us. 
given us uh, even pocket money and the uniforms, etc. So everything was really, uh, there is, was no change from what he's obtaining at home, as far as I was concerned. Okay. And uh, of course, we, I knew that um, one has got to work very hard. I know in those days, even there was no, when we come for holidays, for example, there was no electricity where people can, uh, you know, read like that. So the wives of my father were given allowance, money, to buy pet, uh, kerosene for hurricane lamp. I was also being put, and you know, I was also made to enjoy that uh, allowance because everybody would be sleeping and then I would be reading. And then I went to Kano, Provincial Secondary School, now called Rumfa College Kano, from January 1957 to December 1962. At the Provincial College, Dahiru Mustafa showed early signs of love for the law profession with the way he argued his way out of trouble. Sometimes we may decide to elope into the town, to go without permission into the town and they are, when you are in a boarding school you are not allowed to be in the town unless it is either Friday or Sunday. So when we are met either with a teacher or with a prefect, you say, why are you in the town? I hear you say, let me speak. If it is a, a prefect, he will say, I'm in town because you are in town too. The law covers, the regulation covers you and me. Say, ah, say, but, but I come here in order to find out people like you. He said, he will say, in Islamic law, you are not allowed to intrude into a person. Whatever he is doing, you should not go and spy him. <laughs> so this is, you keep going, the matter will come to the school and he will repeat himself. And usually people will say, diary is right. Why you as a prisoner, you should be in town. That's why you are showing them bad, bad manners. That's why they are, they are there. And the reason he told you, our Arabic teacher will call, he said, it's correct. It's correct. It is the Islamic law. That you don't, you don't spy on a person and see what is he doing. If he is doing something wrong, I will take him to the court. I will take him to the police. It's not allowed. When he sees a teacher, uh, he said, why are you in the town? He will say exactly the reason. If we went to buy something, which is not within the school compound, he will tell him that we just cross to buy either groundnut or soap or sweet or something. We are not here just to roam about. And uh, usually teachers accept what they will say, what you see, you, see uh, you should have asked for permission. Who were his classmates? Uh, my classmates were so many, and a lot of them, you know, ended up, uh, we've been together. I could talk of uh, lawyers, there was Justice Ardi Mohammed, who retired as presiding justice of the Court of Appeal here in Abuja. As a matter of fact, it was him who made it possible for me to read law. We were classmates in the secondary school. Another classmate of mine was General Saini Abacha. We entered the secondary school at the same time uh, in 1957, as I told you. There were Wada, late Wada Abu Bakr, who was the deputy governor of Kano State at one time. He also followed me to become a lawyer, although junior to me. At one time he served 
even at the chief registrar of the court when I was the chief judge of Kano State. Mm -hmm. uh, there was another classmate, Modibu Abubakar, who also served, he's late now. He served as a judge of the High Court of Jigawa State. He also was by far behind me. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of other schoolmates mm -hmm. of mine. Uh, some of them are alive, some are dead. Even our monitor, we used to have a, our class monitor is still alive. He's in Kano. Uh, I mean, we are higher. And we used to, we have to have, we have some meetings, etc. Those of us that are alive. From secondary school, I think about 11 of us are still alive. While at the school, he was nicknamed Lucy. And that has stuck with him till today. Well, I, 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 can, I remember the nickname. The boys called him because of his uh, kind attitude. They called him Lucy. When he came here yeah, to tell me that he has been appointed Chief Justice of the Federation, the first uh, um, thing I said, I said, What's well, good, Lucy? Mm -hmm. I'm happy that Lucy has become uh, 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 Chief Justice of the Federation. Yes. How did he come about the nickname in the first place? Let us hear from Lucy himself. Uh, you know, Lokai, that is ma in mathematics, was all beyond everybody. So I was bragging to my classmates, my schoolmates, even those that were in the senior class did not know anything about it because it was taught in the secondary school. So I got the name Lucy because they, it was L-O-C-I. <laughs> So people started calling me Lucy because of uh, my bragging about knowledge of that mathematical uh, <laughs> situation. Did he have any role models in school? Oh yes, of course, definitely. I mean, especially I was interested, as I told you, in English. And then the debating society was the highest uh, thing. We got a student's parliament. And then the, I think the speaker then was one late ambassador Mahmoud Abu Bakr, he's dead now. So everybody wanted to emulate him in his spoken English. And there was also another chap called Badai Ahmed Wali, whose English was really fantastic, and everybody wanted to emulate him. Uh, from there, I started working as a temporary angry clerk with the former government of Northern Region in the Ministry of Finance. Before I was selected or elected to read law at Ahmadu University to read part one of the Bible examination. You know, I saw in the newspaper they were advertising at that Institute of Administration as I read that they wanted to take people to study law. So, being my clothes friend, I went asked him, have you seen this? He said, no, he hasn't seen it. Okay. I am interested. Are you interested? He hesitated a little, but I uh, persuaded him and convinced him this is the right thing to do. So he accepted it. We filled the form. Fortunately, we were accepted. So we went to the Institute of Administration where we started uh, reading law. Honestly, I was merely thinking of becoming the, uh, the highest point one could think of at that time was to go and read uh, a course at the, a, at the ABU then. Not ABU, it wasn't even the university then. Mm. Institute of Administration that area. Mm. Uh, that is a senior executive officer's course. That was the highest thing I was thinking of. So when that uh, my friend came with that form, uh, I, don't, I don't know, and then I kept praying and then, and you know, Mark, you also, I was a friend, of, my father's friend was the then Minister of Establishments and Training. He was in charge of training of lawyers, you know, he, he was the Minister of Establishment and Training in the former Old Northern Region. Mm. But then because I wanted to do things right, things right, I even gave my address through my father at Kano, at Kano. And they had to send 
the letter inviting me for the interview, not through the minister in the, where I was staying in his house, but they sent it to my father's address in Kano, and a senior brother of mine brought the papers to me. And then I attended the interview, I passed, and I told the minister that this is what has happened. There were 12 provinces then in northern region. So two from Sokoto, two from Kano, and one each from the other 10 uh, provinces. So we were about um, 14 or 15 who went there. And then at the end of the day, those who passed for the uh, part one examination were about uh, seven or so. And seven of us went to England to complete the studies. While at the United Kingdom, he was at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, from 1964 to 1967. He was also at the Inns of Court School of Law during that period. Was there such a difference between when you were in Amadou Bele University and when you went to the UK? No, 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 there was no difference whatsoever, really. And then uh, I was very lucky also. That same Mohammed Ibrahim, the one who facilitated my joining the primary school, mm. was working for the BBC. And then also he was classmate to now Ambassador Aminu Bashirwali, our Nigerian ambassador to China. He is now currently in China, the Nigerian ambassador. Mm. They were class, they were schoolmates of mine. And we come from the same district at that time. So I had no problem whatsoever. Uh, they met me at the airport and they took me to their house. Uh, Mohammed Ibrahim was working for the BBC, he was a journalist. They took me, you know, I, I, was in the, I was in their house. Eventually we ended up in the house of uh, the former Minister of uh, Defence, Alhaji Inouawada. He's still alive. Uh, he had a house in London at that time. And um, he happened to be an uncle to Ambassador Bashir, I mean Bashir Wali. So he had a house and then at one time or the other we moved, we moved his house and not even paying rent. He returned to Nigeria in 1967 and was at the Nigerian Law School between 1967 and 1968. Upon graduation in 1968, he went straight into private legal practice for eight years. In fact, he was the first indigent from Kanu State to do so. While many see his venturing into private practice as part of his adventurous self, his lordship tells us the real reasons behind the move. But the reason mainly was this. As a, what I call legal trainee, that is those of us who were reading law at that time, yes. our allowance was 57 pounds. No tax, nothing. And that is what we are getting. And then when you come to join the civil service, mm. the salary was 720 per annum, that is scale A1 in those days. Mm. That is 60 pounds per month. You will have to pay rent. You will have to pay for car. You have to take a car and then loan your senior service. And then people look upon you to be really somebody who has made it in those days. And then I thought, you know, I calculated a little bit and I found that after paying the rent, paying for the car and, uh, you know, dressing up as a senior civil servant, etc., what one ends up with was not more than uh, 12 pounds for feeding and for everything. And then with the number of siblings that I have, knowing fully well also I was the first one coming from a large family to travel to England and to be a senior servant, senior civil servant, I felt that um, I could not cope if I joined the public service. So luckily also for me, there was a senior lawyer who was senior to me about three years, although coming from my degree, Alhaji, late Alhaji Kaloma Ali, at one time he came to Lagos and he was looking for somebody who would uh, join him in the private practice in Kano. So 
Without any hesitation, I opted. His Lordship's first appearance in court as a lawyer was in Katsina before Honorable Justice Saliho Modibo Alpha Belgore, GCON, former Chief Justice of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, who was then a magistrate. There was a uh, civil matter between Laji Haruna Danja and Saruki Musawa, the Mana Usman. Mana Usman was brother to the Emir Usman Nagogo and was the Jesuit of Musawa. The two of them, Haruna Danja and Mana Usman, they were involved in some business, but not together. It must be something about rivalry. It's a simple case. I read the pleadings of all the parties. I was sitting as a district judge, which they call a magistrate in the north, when dealing with civil matters. And there were so many senior lawyers for other cases. But the one for Arun Danja was called uh, Alaji Gaji. Alaji Gaji was a leading lawyer in the north. But other lawyers in court were late lawyer Tani, Razak Jr., Abdul Mumin, Razak. And Dahiru was the one to appear for Sarki Musawa. He was just a few days old at the bar. But what Gaji did was to say, I appear for the plaintiff, and with me are. He mentioned nearly every judge, I mean every lawyer in court. Naturally, being the first time he will appear in court, he was so afraid. And he said he was holding brief for Kaloma Ali, in whose chambers he was. And uh, he was only asked to come and ask for adjournment. I said, I'm not adjourning. I fixed this case for hearing. And I must hear it today. But I'll be dealing with other cases. If you have not read your brief, go and read it. I'll give you about two hours ago. So I continue with other cases. They came, they still begged me. I said, well, don't be funny. You are a lawyer already. So you have to present your case. So Gaji introduced himself. Ari Gaji was famous or notorious. I wouldn't know what to say. He called his first witness. So I call on the cross-examination. I first ask one or two questions from the witness to put the way all right for him, because I knew it was a bad case. They just wanted to harass the man. First witness, second witness, third witness. Gaji saw that the case was not going on very well for them. He asked for adjournment. I said, Mr. Gaji, last time I came about six months ago, I said, this case must go on. If you are not going on, I will strike out to your case. You have to start afresh. I see, Mr. Mustafa, what is your opinion about this? He said, well, if it's adjournment, I say, anyhow, I'm not adjourning. Gaji said, I closed my case. I say, yes. Mr. Mustafa, do you have witnesses? He said, none. So I rose, went to my chambers, 20 minutes, just about a page, a page and a half. I wrote my ruling, dismissed the case, awarded cost. So he was so happy that he won his first case and ran back to Kano. The time he spent in Kano as a lawyer was as dramatic as it was exciting. A senior advocate of Nigeria and a colleague of his 43 years ago tells us more. He was a very social person. He was a very social person. In fact, one of the reasons I said I never thought he would ever agree to be a judge. That huh? Suddenly he would disappear from, <laughs> from all these pranks. <laughs> it's a mystery. It's because God has his way of uh, dealing with us as human beings. And he had another nickname. So for his Afro, his Afro, the Afro lawyer. Who okay. I never knew he could cut his hair short. In 1976, 
he was appointed the Attorney General of Kaduna State in what looked like a military coup. When Justice Mama Nasser Saladiman Kazina, who was also the, the second president of the Court of Appeal, uh, was made a Justice of the Supreme Court from Attorney General of Kaduna State, then a vacancy arose and Umaru Abdullahi was made the Attorney General of Kaduna State. So when he qualified to become a judge after 10 years, then he was appointed a judge of the High Court of then Kaduna State. So he wanted to go to the bench. And um, the governor, then governor of Kaduna State said, no, I can't let you go unless you find a stable person to come and take your place at the Attorney General of Kaduna State. I was minding my business as the uh, as a private practitioner, and then suddenly General Sani Abacha and General Babangida, somehow they came to Kano at one time or the other. They said I want I was wanted they wanted to see me in Kaduna. So we would travel to Kaduna almost together. And then it was there, then they said that uh, I had no option other than to accept. The governor of North Central State, late Group Captain Usman Jibreem, may so rest in peace, said, look, I'm not going to swear you in until you find an attorney general for me. I said, fine, no problem. Then I started thinking. Of course, he was the first to come into my mind because I knew he was available. There are other people I considered. He too was linking, was thinking about other people. So the following day, I went back to him. I said, look, I have found an attorney general for you. He said, who is it? I said, Daher Mustafa. He said, perfect. That will do. So I called him. I said, whatever you are doing, you better put it aside and come over to Kaduna. I want to see you. He said, what is up? I said, I'm not going to tell you until you come. So he came to Kaduna and we spent the night. The following morning, I took him to the, to the governor. I said, here, here is your attorney general. He said, perfect. He said, I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to swear you, you in straight away. I said, what about me? He said, now you can no go. <laughs> so that's how we, 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 we got into the uh, problem solved. And he came in, he was sworn in, he came in and reported. And I left to the high court. I was appointed uh, the military governor of Kaduna State, and he was my attorney general, actually. Honorable Justice Dairu Mustafa attended several law conferences and seminars nationally and internationally. He held many positions outside the judiciary. They include board member of NEPA from 1974 to 1976, joint editor, law report of Northern Nigeria from 1976 to 1979, member, Emirate Council from 1969 to 1975, member, Kanu Metropolitan Council, from 1967 to 1975. He is also a life member of the body of benches. He has traveled to many countries and performed the Hajj many times. What kind of a man is Honorable Justice Dahiru Mustafa? Honorable Justice Dahiru Mustafa, all the, for all the period I have known him, he has been a very lively fellow, uh, very considerate, very respectful, and uh, also serious in any assignment that he was given. I know uh, Justice Dairo Mustafa, even as uh, a little young boy growing up uh, in the village, he was a very amenable person who mixed very well with other children. And uh, you can see he is someone <clears throat> who has his mind on higher horizons than uh, a normal child growing up in a village setting. 
Uh, as I told you in the background that we had a, a disciplinary kind of a family. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my brother was a very serious person, a very serious person. Uh, though he plays a little bit, but uh, he is very serious, truly. And uh, we know uh, that the kind of job he was going to handle, uh, he is going to be a little firm about that. Wow, he is a person of very well brought up somebody. He has tremendous amount of respect for his parents, both father and mother. I remember he was uh, a kind of uh, advisor to the local government then uh, as a lawyer. He was the legal advisor to the Panel NA, local government, native authority. He was the local, uh, he was the native authority advisor. And the, all his entitlements at that time, he never touched one cobble from that. Push it to his father, said, take that. I've got nothing to do with that, take it all seeking for good prayers from his father. His mother, he, when he moved to Abuja, uh, he, could, he couldn't possibly leave her here alone. He moved her also. There's a big house where he, she could have stayed on her own when, with a lot of household. He got married to his classmate's sister, and the union produced three children. The eldest, who is a girl, is a senior magistrate, and the other one is also a practicing lawyer, and the other one, the last one, is a pilot. It's uh, my brother's uh, classmate in primary school, secondary school, my late brother, Hassan Sleiman. Is his friend, his classmate, and um, so the first time uh, I saw him is when they visited me in my school with my brother, uh, Colonel Daud Sleiman. So when they came, it's about uh, two, three days to vacation, and normally we go to my brother's uh, anywhere he is. We go to spend our vacation. So when he came, he said that uh, he's going tomorrow and uh, he will send uh, his driver to pick us, myself and my niece. So um, I said, ah, we have finished exams, this and this. Please, uh, can you send tomorrow? Ask permission. They will give me, then we go. So when they left, uh, he came with my husband as a friend. So. He told him, don't, don't go and ask permission. Now, you know these girls, when you go and ask permission for her, she will begin to feel big, that kind of thing. So the following day, I packed my things, waiting, and nobody came. The following day, nothing. Till when we close, and my father usually sent for us. I went home, I said, ah, what is happening? They said, my brother said, next week he will send for us. So when we went, I said, what happened? And his wife was telling me that uh, it's his friend. This, 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 he said, uh, he shouldn't ask for permission to take you out of school. So I said, ah, what is his business? What is wrong with this man? So actually, I didn't know what happened after that. Um, when we came for vacation, he came to the house and he told my brother's wife that he is interested in me. She said, no, you know, she's not well, she's asthmatic, this and this. Why don't you marry the niece? He said, no, it's me. And uh, I don't know, that's how it started, actually. How do his children see him? He's a father in the strict sense of the word, father. He's a father that instills a lot of discipline on all of us. He's done his bit, and he still is doing. 
what fathers normally do mentor talks to us all the time and right from childhood he's a very humble person if very very humble and he always tells us you have to try and be, who are you that's what he says who are you you're just a mere mortal you're here to play your part and then a time will come that you will not be uh, he's a very traditional father uh, in terms of uh, how he relates with uh, his children and everything he's um, um, maybe like uh, how will I say like aloof in a way in terms of how he does things he doesn't join issues with people he does not delve into little issues is the kind of person that allows the micromanagement and the small parenting thing to my mother, who will be the one that will be screaming from morning to night every day. Uh, he only kind of intervenes when the thing becomes very, very serious once in a while. Like sometimes you could actually get away without scolding anybody in the house for maybe a period of about a year or so. You know, people just continue doing their own things normally and, you know, it appears as if he's not there. His um, authority kind of uh, emanates from probably maybe the silence, you know, the sense of uh, you know, that fear of somebody who doesn't say much, is not always there. So there's always this fear that you know whenever he's around, you know, everything just finds his level. <laughs> he's, a, he's a very stylish, elderly gentleman, I would say. Baba, as we all call him, He's a very, very quiet and a reserved person. He always keeps to himself from work. He goes upstairs to his room. In fact, I don't think I can recall maybe one or two times him eating in the dining room with us. But it's very, very rare. He has his lunch and dinner in his bedroom. He loves his space and at the same time, he notices everything. He monitors everything and he rarely speaks about it until the right time comes up. Mr. Mustafa is a well-known, respected person, very honest, humble. Did he spare the rod? His best punishment is go and sit down and face the wall. And believe me, you can spend three, four hours facing the wall. He would have his up to afternoon nap and you'll still be facing the wall. And it was punishment for me because you couldn't play. Did he influence their careers? No. I didn't. I, I didn't. He didn't really say you must study, do this or that. For me, it was a choice and it's been a natural thing for me. Probably as a child, I've watched him every day going to the office and he's a lawyer and a judge and it's been a dream for me. Lifelong ambition. And no, no, no. Like for my first son, I wanted him to be a doctor. And uh, he started medical school. But uh, in his, he's about to go into his uh, third year. And he came home, said he's sorry, cannot be dealing with sick people all the time. I tried to influence the son, Kaloma, to become a doctor. Yeah. And after what happened, I just, yeah. What are the moments? the children cherish most? When I turned eight, when I, I turned eight, probably it skipped his mind to okay. say happy birthday to me. So I ran to him in the evening and said, today is my birthday. You didn't say happy birthday to me, nor did you give me a birthday present. And he brought out a tasbah, these beads for prayer, and he gave one to me. And he held the tip of it and said, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, and Allah Akbar. Believe me, that has been the best birthday, birthday present anybody has given me in this world. Um, when my son turned 10, I did that with him too. And I hope he will keep to it. There are so many things that I've learned, or we have learned as children from him, that he never actually sat down to explain to you this is what you should do or why you should do it. But just observing how he does all these things, you know, over the years, just gives you, you know, it tells a whole lot better story than, you know, you know, just shouting and screaming and, you know. Yeah, uh, my dad wasn't feeling well in 1990, was it, or 89. 
he wasn't feeling well he came back from uh, his usual evening outing he usually goes out at five and comes back at 8 39 every day of his life right now he's not in the country but i can tell you what he is doing yes i can tell you what he's doing right now he came back he wasn't feeling well about to go for to england for for treatment he was walking up the stairs then we're living on in benin fifth avenue he was walking up the stairs i looked at him and i busted into tears <laughs> Without saying uh, Baba sorry or something, he just came back walking up the stairs because our mom was talking to us that our dad wasn't feeling well. And I'm a very, very emotional person. He was walking up the stairs, I was walking down. So we met on the way. Immediately we had eye contact. I busted into tears. Then he held up my hands. We went upstairs to his room. He told me he was going to be okay, which that is not his normal, normal habit. Normally he would say, hey, why are you crying? I, you know, wake up. You know, he was really, really fatherly and he cuddled me around. I think I'll never forget that day. How does he relax? He reads a lot. He reads a lot. Even in his young days, I had, because I was not there, that he's always with his uh, lantern. In the village, you know, there is no light. So he's always with his lantern and uh, his book is his friend. He's always reading, 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 reading. Even today, now he's in his room, reading. Even now, after retiring, he reads a lot. Now, but he's reading the Quran and uh, Islamic books more. His lordship is known for his good dress sense. No, I don't know about that. All I know is that I used to wear my hair this big. Yes, That's sense. all what I knew. But I don't know about any dress sense or whatever. <laughs> I just dress normally. I don't want to be flamboyant or anything of that nature. Yes, but your colors seem to match. Well, I try to, you know, I try to okay. ensure that I do things uh, yeah. that are right, etc. So we call him dress to kill. He would, <laughs> he would dress to kill. Everything about him will be perfect. If he is wearing a brown suit, it will be a brown shoe, it will be a brown tie, it will be a brown shirt. I mean, <laughs> he dresses to kill. Honorable Justice Dairo Mustafa has a reputation for being strict and fearless in the course of his career on the bench. But I want to point out one of his last judgments mm -hmm. as he was about to go out and i was in court and it was an on, on the bench judgment what does that mean sir that is as if he had listened to the lawyers yes, and he said this is my judgment and he started writing there and then he had told the lawyer that he was wrong on the law openly to the embarrassment of everybody. And he brought out the authority and said, look, you, you, you come here, all seven of us sitting down here to waste our time. And of course, that in fact marks his fearlessness, his impartiality and his ability to be strict on the law. It is the case of PDP and INEC. Looking back, it can be said that life has been good to him. January 1979, I was appointed a judge of the High Court of Kano State. And out there, with some of my colleagues who are doing our work, we are not moving anywhere, we are all in Kano. But perhaps we we'll go to other places local government headquarters one or two to hear special cases from one time or the other then uh, in 19 in the same year 1979 by october then the chief judge of kano state was a european jesse J.R. jones and he was leaving somehow for one reason or the other i was selected by the Kano state government to become the chief judge. Even though there are one or two judges who are seniors to me, they are even indigents of Kano. 
So I was uh, made the chief judge. But you know, being uh, me, I don't know what happened. I had to go to the most senior of the judges, late Justice San Aikawa. And I told him, sir, this is what has happened. I got this information and this letter that I am to act at the chief judge before the confirmation by the state assembly. In those days, it is the state assembly that will do the confirmation. It had nothing to do with the federal government under the new dispensation in 1979, under the new constitution. So I said, him being there, and he was classmate to a very, very, very senior to me in age, although only about three years senior to me as a lawyer. But, uh, you know, he said, well, they have seen me, they know I am around, and they have not uh, seen it fit to approach me to become the chief judge, and they approached you. I know you will not um, overload it of me, so you will have to accept. In fact, he drafted the letter of acceptance which I sent to the governor at that time. That is really what has happened. So I became the chief judge just barely eight months after becoming a judge, I became the chief judge of Kano State. Are there any experiences that stand out? Well, uh, for example, when I was Attorney General of Kaduna State, I was also attending the Supplementary Council meeting in advisory capacity, advising the governor. An incident occurred with, with the governor, late Usman Jibrin, over the issue of Radio Kaduna. I think it was in 1976 or 70, 76, during Obasanjo's uh, tenure uh, uh, as the head of state. The federal government wanted to take over all the radio stations, Radio Kaduna, I think Radio Ibadan, yeah, and also the and the show, yes, yes, they wanted to do that. Yeah. And, uh, because Radio Kaduna being what it was, there were some political implications in all those. Yes. So uh, late Usman Jibrin, at the governor of Kaduna State, you know, was uh, opposing the idea and he was doing it openly. Everybody was looking at me at that meeting, sitting behind him to stop him from talking. I was pulling his... Uh, Hands and his dress, please sit down, leave this matter. And then he was doing like this <laughs> to me. Is there anything he would have done differently? No, I think I had been a very, very lucky person. I thank Almighty God for his blessings. Uh, these things all happened without my planning. And I, is, I always tell my children that it's nothing special about me. It's only a God who made it possible. But all I know, whatever you do, you have to work very hard. Nothing is simple in this life. Don't take things easy. Do the best that you can, whatever you will do. I mean, that is, the, that, that is it. But uh, there is really uh, only God's own blessing, that is all. It's God's own making. After all, I told you I have got about, there are about 30 of us, yes. and there was no difference whatsoever. And then for God to choose me, I mean, it was only his own making. Same background, same culture, same tradition, same everything. I mean, what, who am I? He's only God. And I thank him for his mercies and his blessing. As chairman of the Federal Judicial Service Commission, did he face any challenges? No, there were no challenges because what happens is that if head of court wants to make an appointment, looking at the, the position of the judges in his court, either through retirement or death or other, so there are some criteria for him to fill in the vacancies. So he will do that exercise, bring it to me, I will have a look at it, 
and then I advise him on what to do, advertise sometimes, or sometimes write to all the other heads of court. There is a vacancy for appointment of a judge, say, of the Federal High Court or the Court of Appeal. Uh, have you got any nominations, etc., etc.? Then they bring in the nominations. And then we ask for uh, judgments that have been written by the person to be appointed, about 10, sometimes 5 judgments, and then the CVs. And then we also sometimes um, ask the security officers to give us, to examine, to go to the persons, you know, to find out his character, etc. Because, you see, it's difficult once you appoint a judge to remove him. It's very, very, it's not that easy. So we have to be sure that what we do, we get the best to man the courts all the time. Now that he is retired, what next? Write a book? After I rest a while, I would uh, want to write something. I can't just sit down idle doing nothing, except playing golf, probably. <laughs> but I will be writing. I mean, I had always been writing. His better half has the last say. You should thank God he lives long to be 70. So he should uh, take it easy, maybe pick up a spot a little and uh, read his books. He near his God and his family. Honorable Justice Dairu Mustafa has served Nigeria with the best of his ability. The Federal Judicial Service Commission, on behalf of the nation, says thank you to Losi, the Afro lawyer.